Again, you're a new creature in Christ. You have all these, God has so worked that you can walk in newness of life, but you still have what? You still have the flesh. And the reality is we still do what? We still sin. The sin principle is still at work. And we understand that. God is absolutely holy. We are not. At the end of Romans chapter 7, and Paul speaking there, I think in present tense experience, at the end of that long discussion of the sin problem, what does he say? He says, the Apostle Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Right? And there is that sin principle still at work. Paul knew that. John's writing about it. See, sin and confession is more than just giving God a list of the things you've done wrong. That that's as far as it goes. You're not really where God wants you to be in this matter of confession. Sin, confession of sin is a reality. That God is absolutely holy. And we're still down here. It may include confessing verbally specific sins. But it needs to go further than that. It needs to speak to this disparity. It needs to acknowledge God how much I need you. Do you see that there? That's part of what Nehemiah is doing. He's acknowledging his need for God. He's praying for God's intervention in his life. Go to Psalm 51. Read there. But uh, you don't have to go there now. I'm sorry. Go there later. And read there what David prays in his confession of sin. And uh, you'll see much of the same thing. To be sure, he's acknowledging a specific sin. But he goes beyond that. And he talks about how much he needs God's intervention in his life uh, for the sin problem to be defeated. And so that brings us to 1 John 1 9. First, you have God in his holiness. Then you have man in his sin problem. And then you have verse 9. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you can't get to verse 9 unless you first went to verse 8 and then you first went to verse 5. You see that there? There's a progression of thought that exists there that's important in our confession of sin. Notice that Nehemiah's confession was based on two tragic realities. The first, we have acted very corruptly against you. The term translated very corruptly <coughs> is a term that means to ruin, destroy, or spoil. It's translated offend in Job 34, 31. In other words, we have offended you, God. We have ruined this, our part of this covenant that you gave to us. And so Nehemiah was confessing that they had disregarded the covenant, the laws which had been a part of what God had blessed them once. In one sense, the believer in Christ is a changed man. He's been born again. He's a new creature in Christ, free from sin. Does not mean, however, that he is without sin. There's still the flesh. As long as we remain in these earthly bodies, we deal with sin problem. There will always be a need for confession of sin. Because as long as we're apart from Christ, we will deal with it. In fact, the more we grow in holiness, the more we'll realize the extent of this disparity that exists between ourselves and our holy creator God. Uh, notice the second thing that he acknowledged. He said, We have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Their offense against God, their corruption was made evident in their disobedience. They had not kept any of the law. They had utterly failed in all respects. And Nehemiah was openly confessing to God the failure of his people, his father's house, and himself in failing to uphold the covenant. There is a need for us believers in Christ to be confessors of sin. Confession ought to happen all the time in the life of a believer. And a part of the challenge for that is that if we're not in the Word of God, we're not thinking about the holiness of God. And we're not seeing as the sword of the Word reveals. And so we just kind of walk along in life not realizing these things. God wants to reveal the sin problems in our life because He loves us. He's got an answer for them. The answer is found in Christ. And so there's a need for confession. 
I was talking to a man the other day who didn't see himself as a sinner. So I went through some of the Ten Commandments to explain how we all fail to measure up to God's holy standard. He is still unfazed, so I told him that he has a wrong standard of measurement when it came to sin. The standard is not everyone else. When we use that standard, we can always find some other poor soul who is worse off than we are. The standard is God. The standard is Christ. The standard is perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect love. We all fall short of Christ's attitudes and actions. And, you know, if we're just honest with the scripture, it doesn't take very long to realize that. I'll, I'll just give you one scripture. That no, no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. How are you doing? Did you go the whole week? Perfectly in obedience to that command? What do you think? How did you do? I, I would argue that none of us did. How about do all things without grumbling and disputing? You know, there's a boy, that's a big, a big one there. Now you're stepping on <laughs> And so if we're honest with the scriptures, if we're honest with the scriptures, we're going to say, yeah, I do fall far, far short. Lord, I confess my sin. I need your help. By your grace, help me to put off that sin and to put on Christ's likeness in his place. God delights in doing that. He wants to bestow his grace on you and his favor by the Spirit of God that you might make those changes. In his book on prayer, Andrew Murray catalogs some of the kinds of sins we need to confess. Just to think about this a little bit more. We must confess and acknowledge the working of pride in us. So many things that the world would sell to us as good things, not so good at all. Fame, ego, self-esteem, pride, all those things are working against us contrary to God's plan. We must confess the breaking out in anger. Oh, what a problem that is for us, isn't it? How prone we are to anger. Somebody does something we don't like. And you see the things in the news that happened recently? In this last week, in a society gone out of control with violence and anger, we as believers in Christ, there ought to be a huge difference in our life. You see a group of teens who beat up on a girl because they didn't like what she said on MySpace. You see another group of three-year-olds who beat up on their teacher. And these kind of things, there are things happening in our society every <laughs> single day that just defy understanding and imagination. But you know what? Those same seeds of angry thought and intent are there in my heart too. And, and there really is only one answer for it, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And confession is the means by which God can pour forth His life into our lives, whereby we can be changed, we can be transformed, we can have Christ's likeness by the Spirit of God within our lives. And the means, the mechanism by which you get to one place to the other, part of that is confession of sin. And so if there's no confession, there's no what? Transformation. There's no change. This is a revival prayer because it includes that element. That's why there's the changes. Because Nehemiah is come and clean with God. We've sinned against you. My Father's house has sinned against you. I've sinned against you. God, we need your help. We need your deliverance. Oh. Mm -hmm.